Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. Episode 81, I'm Tom Merritt. Hey, I'm Brian Brushwood. He's Brian Brushwood in a hotel lobby. <laughs> this is, is going to be a very... This is a very special edition of Frame Rate where I'm going to be the most muted you will ever hear me. And it's just because I don't want to drive everyone else nuts here in the lobby. The best part is that you're in the lobby because you're at a hotel for a conference to talk to people about presentation skills and personality. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So maybe I should record this and be like, do the opposite of what I do this entire episode of Frame Rate. Thanks, guys. <laughs> also and joining us today, uh, Scott Wilkinson from Home Theater Geeks. Uh, hey! Scott. That's, that's not uh, a spoiler. He's, it's okay to announce Scott right now. <laughs> <laughs> hey, guys. How you guys doing? Oh, it's great to have you back on Frame Rate. Uh, of course, uh, Home Theater Geeks, just part of your empire. Uh, you're, you're also a uh, home theater expert and writer. Yep. 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 I'm on uh, home theater dot com and uh, I'm also a musician and I play uh, various various things here and there and sub for Leo when he's out of town. Very yeah. happy to do that. The, always. the tech guy, right? Now, mm -hmm. uh, one of the reasons we had you on, we love having you on Frame Rate any, for any excuse, but one of the reasons uh, you got to go see Brave yesterday. We're going to talk about that a little <laughs> later in the show. You bet. It was fabulous. Oh, good. Good to hear. Let's start off, though. With Great. The big now I already story. know how it ends. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Big story. Right. Big story. Big it up. Big up the stories. stories are this good. just in the big story. Uh, late last week, the Justice Department opened an investigation into whether cable companies are acting improperly to suppress online video competition. Uh, because of bandwidth caps. Investigators have spoken with several major players, Netflix, Hulu, Comcast, Time Warner Cable, about the monthly caps placed on the amount of data subscribers can download. Uh, the probe comes not just in respect to the caps, but also Comcast uh, allowing you to have their own video on demand not count against your cap, even if you're watching it on a computer. Consumer advocates say bandwidth cap exemptions violate net neutrality rules, and so the Department of Justice is looking into it. Doesn't mean they're actually suing or anybody's in trouble yet, they're just investigating. Now, do you think that this is a case where they – this was a long time coming anyway, and they uh, finally decided, you know what, bandwidth caps are inherently anti-competitive to new services like Hulu and Netflix? Or do you think this is a case where this is just a response to the outrage of Comcast's pushing the line 
and not counting their own service towards the bandwidth cap? That's a, that's a really good question because I know the FCC and Comcast are not on the best of friendly terms. Uh, but it's always right. it's always easy to overinterpret how much emotion goes into these sorts of things. There's certainly a very rational reason why the Department of Justice will look into this because people, like you say, are outraged and are complaining. Scott, what do you think? Oh, absolutely. I I think that uh, that it's ridiculous. First of all, to have a cap on things because you know what does it cost them? It doesn't cost them anything. Um, and I, I welcome this investigation. Not that I think anything will come of it. Yeah, well, think- that's uh, that's the question, right? Uh, you know, the Department of Justice looks into it and goes, "No, we don't. We don't see any reason to bring a lawsuit or or sue anybody. Everything yeah, looks yeah, fine. No, no, it's all right. Everything's okay. That's that that is but one again, outcome." There- there's more, there's more than just the lawsuit itself. There's this constant game of chess happening, and it's the kind of thing where it's like if they get ready, if they make noise and bluster indicating that they might sue or that they might bring down the hammer or take action, that can have a chilling effect on the decisions that these guys make. So it's not insignificant. I mean, on one hand, yes, this is all nonsense. It's just them saying we're getting ready to get ready to maybe do look at doing something. But on the other <laughs> hand, this is this is a shot across the bow. That it's a warning shot. It says. Look, we're starting to uh, we're starting to notice some pressure out here. We're not comfortable with it, and it could affect the way these cable companies handle it. Yeah, that's actually uh, a good point because we saw this with BitTorrent uh, packet inspection, where Comcast was accused of killing BitTorrent packets. There was rumblings of an investigation happening, and then Comcast immediately said, no, 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 we don't kill BitTorrent packets. Uh, Here's the proof. We're not doing this anymore. We're not cutting people off for using BitTorrent. And by the way, you have no right to investigate us even if we did. (laughs) But the the chilling effect that you're talking about worked in that case, and it backed them off of a possible net neutrality violation. In this case, they've actually gone and done something. They said, we're going to exempt this kind of traffic from your bandwidth cap, but only because it really isn't part of the Internet. Uh, And so the Department of Justice is looking very closely at that to say, well, let's see if this argument has merit. Let's see if it is something that we should uh, bring. But it's the kind of thing that will stop Comcast from going farther, most likely. And it's the kind of thing that will stop or dissuade other ISPs from trying the same thing. Aren't there others that are doing yeah. it already? Well, there's lots with bandwidth caps. I don't know if anybody's going no, no, as no. far as Comcast with that video on demand that I've heard of. Have you heard of something? I haven't, but uh, uh, not specifically. Not in the U.S. But, anyway. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But uh, I've certainly heard a lot of chatter and uh, about you know providers not counting their own content uh, against this these bandwidth caps. Well. And- Keep, keep in mind also that, in, in all fairness, this is a case where I like that this is happening and it's good for net neutrality and it's good for uh, fairness for consumers. Uh, I'm kind of bummed that if this is the test case that has pushed it forward, I'm bummed that this is the one because, to be honest, really all they're doing is offering the same video on demand service that cable operators usually offer. The only thing is that they're doing it as an over the top service. It, 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 they're using virtual pipes instead of actual pipes. And it doesn't seem like that is as good of a reason to take them on for uh, for you know abuse of their the you know anti competitive practices. Like I don't know on how the, good that case is uh, for in this particular instance. On the other hand, didn't you say, Tom, that the um, uh, c- the cable company Comcast is claiming that, that, that this isn't by the internet when it clearly is? Yeah. Well, they're saying it it starts in our location. And goes over our pipes directly to your house. It never goes out over the internet, and that's a matter of definition. Uh, yeah, it's you know, right it, me. It, it isn't going leaving Comcast's network at any point, right? But it is definitely traveling over parts of the wires that are also <laughs> occupied by packets from the internet. So yeah, exactly. I mean, it's not. This isn't video on demand over your cable box, right? It's it's. Yeah, but what Comcast is saying is that video on demand on your cable box actually travels on those same wires from part uh, of the way, too. They're okay. just, you know, it's, it's, it becomes well, a semantic a different, debate. Yeah, well, it, and it is a different type of network when they're using uh, video on demand services that are, that there's no, when they're not using IP packets that aren't routed through the Internet, and I don't know anything, by the way, I, uh, this is the way I understand it, it is different mechanically from what they were doing offering a video on demand as an over-the-top service which maybe mostly is not out in the internet, but they can't 
But when they're using IP packets to do it, the, 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 the definition gets blurred. And I'm sure someone out there is screaming right now because I don't understand anything because I'm a total idiot. But, uh, and if so, make sure to write us at framerate uh, at twit.tv. I, uh, I, one thing I would like to say, just going back to what Scott said earlier, which is bandwidth caps aren't absolutely necessary. And I think that's probably true. I mean, congestion is a problem, especially over that last mile that they're shoving this video on the mound, that they're not catting against your bandwidth cap. That's where the congestion is a problem. And bandwidth right. caps really don't do much from all the studies we've seen. They don't do much to actually alleviate congestion. What this is, is the, is the uh, ISPs trying to figure out a better way to price things. Uh, you right. know, with electricity, How to make more money. Yeah, exactly. With electricity, it's metered, not because the electricity only comes in like water into your house. Electricity is on all the time. And even if you don't use it, it's being sent. So they meter it as a way to, to, to charge you in case you're pulling more electricity in and, and, and causing the demand overall to get high. So you could argue that electricity isn't even exactly charging you for what you use all the time. And, and it gets even weirder when you're talking about the internet where you know blinking lights do not cost more to blink more when the packets <laughs> are going through the router. I've heard uh, you know, lots of people like Larry Page say that. Uh, but there is, there is a need to figure out how best to charge people for access. Agreed. Yeah, I think we just yeah. solved this issue. Well Excellent. done, Tom. All done. You know, I, I'm going to have a uh, bandwidth cap special coming up in July. Uh, I'm trying to get uh, – I, I think I've got Benoit Felton who conducted the study that said bandwidth caps actually don't alleviate congestion, it doesn't seem. Uh, oh, I'm going to have Dane Jasper from SonicNet, Chris Mitchell from Muni Networks, uh, Reed Fischler from a, one of the backbone providers, and, uh, and we'll dig into this issue. So I'm looking forward yeah, to I that. Think, I think that's actually the gold standard there too is if at the end of the day you could talk about uh, – whether something is a right decision to make or a bad decision to make, whether it's fair or unfair. But at the end of the day, the one I care about the most is, is it even effective? Because if it's not effective, it's sort of like DRM. If at the end of the day, DRM doesn't work, it annoys the consumers and the piracy happens anyway, then you need right. to fundamentally reevaluate whether or not it's a good idea. Okay, uh, let's get to another big story, which I know is pretty close to Scott's heart. Stop everything. It's another big story. <laughs> well, I, don't, I don't know how close to your heart it is, but uh, the Roku CEO, Anthony Wood, predicted at the TV of Tomorrow show in San Francisco last Wednesday that Blu-ray will be dead in four years. Will you uh, not be covering Blu-ray players on Home Theater Geeks in four years, Scott? Uh, I hate this. I really do. I, You know... It's the same old argument that, that happened with uh, music, and that is consumers choosing convenience over quality. Uh, you know, streamed media is very convenient. It's really great for that, but it just simply doesn't have the same quality as Blu-ray. I'm really hoping and advocating very strongly any way I can that uh, Blu-ray not go away. It may very well become a niche product, sort of like LPs. Yeah. Sure. Um, well, you know, the L okay, so I got a question for you. Today. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, we, we've talked about this uh, before. We've talked about the fact that convenience always trumps fidelity in the marketplace. Uh, is there a level of, of universal uh, broadband that everyone could have that would reach a level of streaming quality where you would feel okay about giving up um, uh, stream media? Like what, what's the throughput on a Blu-ray device? What, what do we have to hit in order to yeah. match 90% of the way to a Blu-ray? Very good question. Uh, I Blu-ray throughput or uh, bit rate on a, within a Blu-ray player approaches about 40, 45 megabits per second. So, you know, if, we could, if, we, if most homes in America had that kind of input, had that kind of bandwidth, uh, then I would say we, we could get to the point of approaching Blu-ray quality. You know, uh, but... You know, that's how how long is that going to take? I mean, we don't even have a our per capita bandwidth in the U.S. is, I don't know, something under 10. You the, know, in, uh, in South Korea, it's 20. The uh, the problem, though, is not just the size. So even as the even as the size becomes more manageable, as we get faster connections and bigger storage, we haven't all switched to flack in audio. We True. continue to take sure. advantage of the fact that MP3s and AACs are small, and right. and and we you know what MP3s 
percentage of your hard drive on an average hard drive in 2001 was much larger than it is now. In fact, I, I would just guess. I, don't, I haven't done the calculations, but I would guess that if you just did FLAC for all of your, uh, which is an uncompressed, you know, higher quality uh, format. Audio if format, you, if yeah. If you did that for all of your songs, it would take up the same percentage of your hard drive that MP3s did several years back. I don't know exactly how many years, but several years back. That, that makes sense because hard drives, of course, are getting a lot bigger for a lot less money now. And so you could store uncompressed or losslessly compressed, which is what FLAC is, uh, audio on your hard drive. And you're right, not take up any more percentage of the hard drive than you used to some number of years ago with MP3. But we don't do now, that. Now, keep in mind, well, uh, I mean, that's, that's true. Uh, what, one thing, now, I know Scott wants the, the highest quality out there. And what if, now, understand, the article didn't say necessarily that streaming will replace Blu-ray. It said that Blu-ray will be dead four years from now. So it could be that we could see a hybrid solution where you download, you know, you take three hours, four hours, or overnight to buffer a movie, and then you're able to own it on your hard drive and watch it in true Blu-ray quality. If something like that was available, would you be on board with that, Scott? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that's what uh, a lot of people are talking about, sort of the next revolution in video quality being 4K, right? The quadruple the resolution of, of high definition. And, and my first thought about that is, yeah, sure, I'd love that. But, uh, you know, try streaming that. You know, that's going to take forever. Right. And, and it's going to end up being, as you, exactly as you say, Brian, uh, uh, you know, a download into some sort of storage uh, overnight or something so that by the time you wake up the next day, then you can watch it at full quality without worrying about buffering or traffic on, you know, your kids doing homework or something else on your home network. Um, you know, it's going to be easier to do that. That and, I could and, see and as honest, a, a model. That's, that's already what we do with our video games. That's the way steam runs is that you don't, you don't stream your video games. You take, you do a digital download. It lives on your computer. You have access to it anytime you want. And to be honest, this is the kind of thing that we're looking for with um uh wait, wait what's what's that new format that I can't even remember the name of the consortium that they're all building uh, You're talking about the, say, the ultraviolet? Yes, there you go. I wanted to say wildfire uh, for some reason. Uh, th <laughs> th that's what we're looking at. And to be honest, I think that uh, that it's not just that uh, that Blu-ray is going to go away. I think that ultraviolet will replace it. You still get a copy locally that is the highest quality that uh, that you can access at any time, whether you're connected or not. Um, theoretically, I don't know the specific details, but uh, but I'm okay with that. There's nothing I love about physical media. I don't like I don't like losing the discs. I don't like having to remember where they are. I don't like mm -hmm. instruction manuals. I just want well, the movie, and if they, and if I can get that without physical product, then good riddance to it. Well, you know, a lot of people feel that way. A lot of other people feel that uh, humans, uh, human nature is to collect objects mm -hmm. and there are a lot of people who really want to see the physical discs on, in their library um i think that's why we see lps still around because it satisfies a bit of that need there's also an audio quality that people like but i right. think there's also that i like to have that big album art i like to hold it i like to see it and know i have it michael fremer on my show on home theater geeks a week or so ago said exactly that you know how how do you in, in enjoy the album art on a cd it's so small much less streaming which is not at all uh <clears throat> whereas on an album you got this nice big beautiful piece of art you got lots of text you can read uh that's one aspect of it but i think the main one as you have said just a moment ago that uh is that um the quality, the, the audio quality of the thing uh, is unique and different than any kind of digital dis delivery. So what we need are giant Blu-rays. There you go. So that we get the big album art. They were called we laser discs. Yeah. Wait, I was about to say, <laughs> this sounds like a cool laser, laser disc. <laughs> 4K laser disc. I like it. Let's work on it. All right. Uh, we should uh, just remind you that the source of this story, by the way, CEO Anthony Wood of Roku, has a vested interest in you switching to streaming because he makes yeah. the Roku player, which provides streaming access. Uh, but right. you know, it, I think it's a it's a fair point to debate, and there's a lot of good stuff to be said. Oh, about absolutely. It. A lot of people are saying, "Oh, yeah, physical media is on its way out." I I don't subscribe to that in part because of uh, wishful thinking. I think physical media is going to decline. I don't think there's any question about that. Yeah, but I don't yeah. think it's all on its way out. Some things will be 8-tracks, some things will be LPs. Uh, in right. other words, some things will entirely disappear and we won't see them. I think DVDs are probably that way. Nobody's going to want to have DVDs in 10 years. 
Blu-ray might stick around. It might get supplanted by a different kind of higher quality optical media. It's hard to say. Yeah, hard to say. Yeah. Or film. Maybe we'll all buy films. <laughs> film the ultimate, The ultimate inconvenience for the home user. <laughs> all right, let's move on to yet another big story very quickly here. Tuck in your bootstraps. It's yet another big story. Netflix is getting developers all riled up by changing the terms of service for its API. Uh, they, they put a blog post up on June 15th that coming this September, they're going to change access to the information about rental history and, and streams. It's all been in one API, and as part of Netflix's move away from DVDs, they're splitting this up on the API end. They're not spilling it up on the consumer end. You're, nothing's really going to change for you. But the people who make apps that take advantage of this information from Netflix won't be able to take advantage of that information anymore. And uh, there's a little confusion in the terms of service about whether they're actually allowed to charge for anything they do take advantage of. Uh, for instance, a lot of companies will search the Netflix database and surface what's available on Netflix as a guide. Clicker does this. Sidereel does this. Uh, there's some question about whether they could charge for their services under these terms of use. Netflix has responded saying, look, the, the changes are targeted at consumer, aren't targeted at consumer-facing apps. They're intended to prevent developers from repackaging the API as a service for connected TVs. In other words, they don't want people to make their own Netflix app that streams the movies to you without Netflix having any say over it. Guides or, or and things like that farming. are fine. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, and understand, you you could, you know, I could put together a program called Brian's Movie Guides where, uh, you know, it's it's Brian's ratings or Brian's take on whatever, and the entire thing could be just lifted directly from from Netflix's API. Or from the ratings on down, everything could be a fraud, and, and it's important that they have some kind of structure to protect against that. I think that's fine. But they are dumping a lot of the metadata that developers depend on uh, to, to make valuable v added services. Uh, the functional changes eliminate nearly everything related to a viewing history, including rental history, when rented discs are shipped and returned, when streamed films are watched, and the bookmark information for streamed videos paused in programs. I think Netflix is trying to can take control of this because I think Netflix is going to roll out some sort of uh, deal with Facebook. Remember, they, they've been say, they've been doing this outside of the U.S. and they're trying to get the law changed in the U.S. to allow them to send all of your streaming information to Facebook. So I, I have a feeling that that's behind the change in this API. Mm. Interesting. I have a I ha I've always had trouble with the fact that the Netflix app on different TVs, different Blu-ray players, different streaming boxes, all looks different. And I don't know how, how well this relates to exactly what, what they're talking about here, but I would sure love to see a consistent user interface across all platforms. Well, that's interesting. They're saying to the developers, look, we don't want you to be creating something that looks like Netflix because that would cause confusion. But you're, you're pointing out, well, there's already confusion with the official Netflix. The, the Netflix app on that's Apple right. looks different than the Roku one, which looks different than the web one. Which That's yeah. exactly right. That's exactly right. And it bugs it. Heck out of me. Yeah, well, maybe maybe that is an outcome of this, is that we'll see a, a more consistent approach. I doubt on Apple, though. Apple controls their interface. Right. If Netflix wants to be there, they're going to have to live in the Apple interface, I'm afraid. <laughs> afraid so. Let's move on to the slipstream. A couple of quick hits here off the top. Uh, YouTube uh, is redesigning its interface, and it looks more Google Plus-like. Have you guys had a chance to take a look at that? I have I not yet. noticed it. The, the biggest thing I've noticed is I am in love with the fact that now when I go to YouTube on the first page, I see all the videos that were recommended or put on, uh, posted by people I follow on Google+. Plus. I love, I'm, I'm, the more I'm encountering this cross-pollination between Google services, the happier I am with their decision to, to make an ecosystem. Now, that's me talking as, as just a consumer using this stuff long term. I don't know if, if, if it's going to end up affecting the quality of their search results or any of the things that we're worried about with this. But for right now, uh, as a dumb user, I'm enjoying it immensely. I think that what YouTube is doing is good. I, th I, I, I have enjoyed all of the changes that they've made. However, I still think they're not doing a good enough job of pointing you towards the high-quality content that they're spending all this money on. 
Uh, you know, they are you kidding me? They got ads before every single that well, pre-roll. Every no, no, no. Minutes, I, granted, granted they, they, they're definitely promoting it. But when I land on YouTube.com, I don't see a like here. Here are all the channels. I don't see a cable guide sort of interface. Right? It's hard. So you would prefer like you show up and there's like five big boxes. Like you want to tune into the Nerdist. You want to tune into Geek and Sundry. You want to tune into you know whatever the different channels are. Make them more like channel channels. I, I would like to see that surface somewhere. I still want to have all the customization. I only want to see the channels up top that I subscribe to. But it's hard to find. Mm-hmm. It's hard to browse through what else is available. That's that's my issue. How would you do that though? Because there are so many channels available. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's, I'm not saying it's an easy order. You're right. I mean, <laughs> you have to come up with a good user interface that you can drill down by type of channel, and of course, everybody's going to want to exactly. be in the weird types of channels. Um, but but it's not much different than the cable TV model, and I think they kind of need to do it if they really want these channels to succeed. Well, except the cable TV model goes about, uh, is organized around time and date. You mm-hmm. know, it's like. You know, uh, coming That's up at point. three o'clock is this list of channel of shows, and then three thirty this list of shows. On on uh, YouTube, it seems to me that wouldn't be practical. You could do a posted today, I guess, but yeah, you're right. It's not a direct analog. I I I just I as as someone who's doing a show that's on one of these channels. I want to see what else is out there. I think this is where this is coming from. I'm like, okay, what are the other channels doing? And you know, mm-hmm. I want to see those shows, and. When I go you to don't even look, know how to go about searching for them, sure. Like, well, where do I find them? I heard about this home and garden-like uh, DIY ch- show. How do I find that if I don't remember the name? There should be a way for me to drill down to it. I guess that's, that's what I'm saying. I think doing it by, by uh, category or topic you know, is a good idea. I, I, would, I would go for that. Like home and garden. Oh, oh okay. That's, that's, then there are 10,000 home and garden channels, and then you have to be able to drill down some way to narrow the focus after that. Everybody in the chat room is like, Tom just wants Sword and Laser to be on the front page of YouTube every day. Oh, no. That's not. Come on. Yes. He's classier than that. I would like that. that, but that's not what I'm expecting. <laughs> that's not <laughs> what I'm talking about right now. Uh, Amazon is building uh, Steam on its Prime Instant Video. We kind of keep bringing these up. There's not a lot to discuss about it, but uh, new Paramount content got added a few weeks ago, and now they're getting MGM Studio movies and TV shows. So little by little, Amazon Prime getting in the game. Yeah, I no, I, 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 oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, I was just going to say, I, I've been using Boxy lately, and I really wish it had an Amazon Prime uh, app, but it doesn't. No, oh, that's too bad. You mean for the streaming? It ha- You can yeah, watch yeah. instant videos on there, right, but not the streaming. I'm sorry? Can you, you can watch instant videos on Boxy, right? I don't think so. No? I haven't found that app yet. Mm. That's, that's maybe, I'm just, maybe I've just missed it. I'll have to go look again. Uh, The cable networks are keeping you from innovation. You probably think this about lots of things. In this case, BBC's iPlayer. Uh, BBC has a 12-month trial of its pay for overseas iPlayer, (gasps) but the cable networks are putting pressure on them not to launch it in the United States. They have threatened to delist BBC America from their cable services in the U.S., uh, forcing the BBC to choose between BBC Worldwide iPlayer and BBC America on cable. Well, so this is the exact... I mean, you remember I faced this when I couldn't wait to see Sherlock, and I ended up using a VPN to watch it on the iPlayer, pretending I was from the UK, and it ended up pissing off some of, some of the British, and, uh, and, and with justifiable cause. And now here's an opportunity where I could have paid, because I wanted to legally see it, uh, and uh, there was no structure for it. So finally they're creating this structure, and now the American guys... Are just like no, Brian Brushwood must wait four extra months to watch Sherlock. <laughs> yeah, it's just a uh, you know, I mean, I it's an example of of the marketplace at work, right? Uh, the cable companies have all the leverage right now. BBC needs BBC America. If they didn't, they would say, well, forget it. It will go direct to the consumer. That calculus is changing all the time, and the BBC is is keeping up on it. BBC Worldwide told paid content. Global iPlayer was set up as a 12-month trial to allow us to assess the product. Consumer demand in different markets and the content mix. We've extended the trial. Although Western Europe launched in July, Australia and Canada came on board later in 2011. Uh, by extending the trial, it allows us to capture more data. So it sounds like they're saying we're still doing the math on whether it's worth going head-to-head with the cable companies over BBC America. See, this is more. This is more of that chess. More of this. I'm not saying anything, but I'm saying I might say something. Right, so I'm getting right, ready to get right, ready right. to possibly make a decision. Right. Exactly right. 
Uh, Google is telling operators of YouTube-MP3.org that by converting YouTube music videos into MP3 files, they violate the site's terms of service and risk legal consequences. They got a, uh, a letter from Google. YouTube has also apparently blocked YouTube-MP3.org servers from accessing the site. Now, this is something you can do yourself, right? I mean, you can just run Wiretap Studio or Audio Hijack or all number of, of captures. In fact, Windows is just built in to be able to record right from the sound card in a lot of cases, depending on what sound card you have. So you, you could do this on your own. But I guess what YouTube is taking uh, exception to is that there is a service that's doing it for you. Yeah, oh, I don't. Oh, damn pirates! <laughs> well, and kludgy pirates as well. I mean, it's just it's it's. I, I, if you're gonna pirate, there are better ways to do it than this. But uh, yes, but I guess I, it's 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 that visible way. I guess it's the the visibility of sites like this that they really want to shut down. They don't want anything out there. Uh, pushing and, and promoting this kind of piracy. Well, and they're right in the middle of negotiations over keeping videos, music videos on YouTube with all these different right. labels. And those labels are probably the ones saying, well, hey, why aren't you shutting down this site that, that is you know, taking those music videos we're giving you and turning them into MP3s? You gotta, you so you think this is, this is them putting on a show for their... Man, again, it's, it's all chess out there. Everyone's moving to, to affect other people's actions. In the game of tubes... You block piracy, or you don't get a licensing deal. <laughs> or you fail That's, to turn a profit. Yeah. Uh, speaking the, of worst, tubes, the worst of all, yes. Let's move on to Tomb Tops. Did you guys see this uh, leaked 56-page document on the plans for the Xbox? I did. I loved it. It's, it was like right. some awesome, crazy science fiction document from the future had come out. And I love that they're thinking this far ahead into digital media where they're talking about projecting digital avatars over your real space. I mean, this is, this is some stuff straight out of Demon and Freedom TM, you know? The part that I only heard about it for the first time last night at the, at the, uh, the big opening I went to, the Xbox 720. I went, oh, finally, they changed the number. <laughs> we'll see if they <laughs> stick to this. We'll see if it's real. A lot of people are looking at it say it, it, it supposedly came out in the fall of 2010, and all of the stuff that was supposed to happen before now did happen. So, hmm. it, it, you know, who, if it is a fake, it is a fake done by people who did their research. But the idea would be that the Xbox 720, which I'm guessing is a working title, would cost $299, have Blu-ray support, a new Kinect with two cameras, and uh, eventually get virtual reality glasses sometime in 2014. But the part that caught my eye for this, story, this show is that they talked a lot about turning the Xbox into a standalone set-top box for all things video. So having Slingbox functionality, having the ability to get channels directly without having to have a cable box, uh, and being able to have universal access to that content on your smartphone or your tablet. Again, that's that sling uh, functionality. Yep. Right. This is, this is in every way what they should be doing. This is so <laughs> smart because they're putting so much power into this device, and it's so ubiquitous. It's in every home. And if they can get most of that functionality onto existing Xbox 360s, if they can put increased functionality on the Xbox 720s, which, by the way, there's no chance they're going to call it the Xbox 720 because 360 means you're seeing things from all angles and you're seeing this wide panorama. 720 just means you're spinning around in circles, wasting your own time. <laughs> it means it's not full HD. It's only 720p. Exactly. That was, that was, that was my good. objection, exactly, that, that it would sort of sound like it wasn't full HD. Now, weirdly, I'd be okay with it being the Xbox 1080 if it was but, – but then again, the current Xbox already does 1080. So hopefully they'll come up with a different name for it. But they have an opportunity to, to essentially rebrand the Xbox as something more than a game console. I wouldn't be surprised if in the next five years you stopped ever hearing Microsoft use the phrase game console with the Xbox. Because it, and to be honest, let the thing define itself as what it is. It's just an Xbox now. Call it whatever you want. You can play games on it. You watch video on it. You can stream music and, and uh, media through it. It's, it's an Xbox. And when you consider that they're using Xbox name on Windows Phone and on this new uh, Windows tablet that they announced yesterday, the Windows Surface or the Microsoft Surface, yes. I think they're, they're spinning Xbox into a brand of gaming from Microsoft. And you're right. It may not even be called an Xbox itself after a while. Xbox would just be the app on the device that plays games. 
Right. Now, the problem is that Microsoft has had a long and notoriously poor ability to brand themselves when it comes to games. Uh, their, their Games for Windows initiative was an abject failure, and I hope that they don't bungle, you know, but meanwhile, what they're doing with Xbox, obviously, you know, it's it's a, been a successful console. So on the, the console side of things, they're doing all right, but it's the PC integration that's been terrible, and I'm nervous about, I, I think there's a great opportunity with the Microsoft Surface, uh, and I think there's a lot that they're doing right, but I just hope they don't screw it up for, for their games uh, integration on it. I do think that uh, what, what we're going to see with the Xbox is in, in the next iteration is going to have a lot more video. I don't know how many deals they can make. They seem to have figured out how to manufacture their own tablet without pissing off all their vendors that also sell Windows-powered devices. Maybe they can figure out how to provide direct video on a game console set-top box-like device without pissing off all of their cable partners. Uh, what do you think, Scott? Well... It sounds to me, at first, I was gonna. I've had this thought that it, it they looks it looks like they're going after the PlayStation Three, which already, you know, the ads for PlayStation Three are it does everything. Sure. So it sounds to me like they're they're trying to catch up, you know, to that that their prime competitor. It seems to me. Uh, but uh, in terms of pissing off their their partners, yes, they they have to be very careful about that, and I'm never quite sure how to. How to do that, not being a business guy. Yeah, right. Me either. Uh, <laughs> Xbox Live, uh, just as a side note to this story, has launched uh, an app to stream Paramount movies. So this, this could be a clue to this. They're going straight to the movie studio. Paramount Pictures will stream Footloose, Mission Impossible 3, The Godfather, uh, among many, many others, right to you as part of the Xbox Live service. That seems like a big deal. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yep, it's another step in the right direction. Yep. And finally, Google TV uh, is uh, probably going to get an update at the Google I.O. Developers Conference at the end of the month. Uh, actually, coming up really, really soon, less than two weeks. Uh, the Google TV team is supposedly focusing on third-party content and second-screen apps, according to a story on Engadget. Uh, judging by recent updates to the Google developer support pages, a focus will be on helping third-party devs create apps full of content as well as control and information apps for mobile or tablets. So making the Google TV service, whether it's in a TV or in a set-top box, have more choices of things to watch, I think that's a no-brainer, but also be able to work with the device you have in your hand, tablet or, or phone. This was the, thi this yeah, was the uh, thing that really... I'm sorry, Brian, go ahead. No, no, by all means, go ahead, Scott. I was going to say, this is the thing that, that always bugged me about Google TV. I, I believed it to be, when I first saw it, to be that sort of ultimate aggregator of content, and it turned out not to be at all. And so if anything they can do to work towards that is okay by me. So here's, here's what I, this is my prediction with Google TV, is just as we're seeing Xbox look up and realize that it has the ability and all the hardware it needs to start uh, streaming all kinds of media and become, you know, essentially take over the functionality of your Slingbox, I think you're going to see the reverse as well. Google TV is going to look up in the next couple of years as the hardware continues to improve and they're going to look up and say, wow, we're running Android. Aren't there like uh, 25 bajillion D different video games on Android devices? Can't we just put them all on our Google TV device? And because so many people are working on the Google TV platform, you have the opportunity for a, uh, instead of this, this five-year cycle of new hardware coming out, you could have a more PC gaming-like cycle where every year there's better hardware coming out. And eventually, I really do see in the next five years, Google TV uh, becoming a, a decent gaming platform, just as I never would have expected the iPad to be a decent gaming platform. Uh, right now, most people don't think Google TV will be either, but five years from now, just remember I said that. All right. <laughs> All I can do, I can play Angry Birds on my Google TV Logitech review box right now. I don't. But Well, but because it's underpowered and, yeah. and the interface isn't good, but, but you're seeing like every four months there's a new and better Google TV. The hardware is better. The, the, the OS becomes more refined. It's that incremental improvement that you cannot get from an Xbox or from a PS3 that I think is going to make it a winner in the long term. All right, let's move on to Film Film. <laughs> Film 
film foul section is all about things to watch. There is neither film nor foul about it usually, uh, and there is neither film, but probably I don't know about foul. A part of our first story here. Uh, Wall Street Journal has been adding lots and lots of video, as lots of print outlets have been doing, and uh, paid content reporting uh, earlier this week that they have launched the inaugural episode of DC Bureau, a political show uh, that is kind of on the co- quality content of the things you'd see on the weekend on NBC or ABC or, or regularly on CNN or Fox News. Uh, yeah, what do you think about this? Is, it, is this uh, the, the death of traditional journalism? Is this a bad thing for journalism in general, or is this just a, a sea change in the way we tell stories and consume media? I, I don't know. It seems to me, seems ahead, to me that, uh, that uh, yet another political show... Uh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> you think that's the last I, thing we need? I think that is. I, I've stopped watching political shows, to tell you the truth. It's just uh, I, I attended a, an interesting uh, seminar the other day uh, with a political cartoonist uh, talking about how the whole aspect of journalism, the whole definition of journalism has changed. Whereas once there was a clear definition between a journalist, a politician, and an entertainer, now that distinction is very blurred. Mm. And, well, uh, and I wonder, you know, here, here's the other thing, too, is, is I think that um, it, it is good to have the intention of being impartial as a journalist. I also don't believe anyone has ever done it. And I believe right. that we're entering an age where everybody freely admits that there's some level of advocacy because uh, you, you cannot double blind your presentation of the materials. What you believe will color even just if somebody else writes the script and you just read it, some part of you is going to color that. And I think that uh, there's an honesty to it now where it's like, yes, uh, it, to be honest, I think we're better off than we were 100 years ago because at least more of us are not pretending like we're partial you, and we're saying you really, things, that's the way it is. You really think that Walter Cronkite colored, colored the news? Uh, in, in ways that, uh, that – in very subtle ways, I think he was better than most. But I think uh, that uh, his enthusiasm for certain things cannot help but, uh, but, but cause uh, – there's no there's a reason that when it comes to FDA trials, they are extraordinarily strict about keeping every segment separate from every other segment and that the, the company that runs the tests can't be the same company that interprets the results. Uh, we are so deeply flawed psychologically as human beings that there <laughs> is no way to keep our biases from, from rating out and all, all, all types of things, especially in direct communication. If we cover a story about something that I genuinely hate – there are a million little things I'm going to say and do that will telegraph that and affect the way you, you, you understand it. And that's important that we recognize, and I think we're more honest about that nowadays than we were 100 years ago. I would agree. I would agree that, that sort of being more upfront, being more honest about our biases, which are always there, as you say, I agree completely with that. Um, on the other hand, we've got now a situation where things are so narrowcast and so niche that – People are only exposed to those ideas with which they agree, and which, yeah, which leads to greater and greater side, polarization. I would counter, though. We, we now have structures like I still get all my news from Google, uh, Google News. And what I love about it is that because it's algorithm-driven, it forces me to read from sources I would never otherwise discover. I'm reading stories from Al, Al Jazeera, from Russia Today, from, uh, from MoveOn.org, from uh, Reason.com. These, uh, I, I think technology, yes, it does have the ability. Now we can all, if we choose to, live in our own little splinter worlds where we just see the things as a mirror of the way we want them to be. But also we have the ability to see the world more clearly for what it really is now than we ever have before. And I think that's a good thing. As long as people choose to take that route, which I think most people don't. I think I have the perfect solution to this discussion. Yes. A xenomorph. What is it? Oh, what? A xenomorph. <laughs> uh, no, I think this is a, a great discussion, but we do, we, we do have to, to move on because I want to get to talking about Brave. Uh, and I also want to talk about this io9 post where they have test footage from Alien that shows uh, a man in his only role, Bolaji Badeo, a Nigerian who's six foot ten, practicing being the xenomorph. So it's just him in, in like boxer shorts and a mock up alien head. And I, I think, think it might be creepier than the movie, although they put creepy music on it, too, so that might be affecting me. 
Well, and I, but also, it's not just the it, obviously the music has a big part of it, but it's also look at the set design, look at the lighting, look at the way this is shot. Um, there, there's a reason that we admire Ridley Scott as a director, and it's for his ability to even as silly as this setup is to still really convey a sense of ominous creepiness as a guy awkwardly sh shuffles down a foam padded hallway. <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't checked it out, absolutely go watch it. It'll be in our show notes at twit.tv slash FR. Just go to io9.com and look for test footage from Alien. Uh, it, is, it is way, way creepy. Final film found story, <laughs> uh, The Hobbit's higher frame rate. Everybody's talking about the higher frame rate that they're going to be showing The Hobbit in and whether it makes it look too cheap and all of that stuff. But Slashdot had a posting uh, about uh, the higher frame rate being a cost to theater operators because they have to actually update the equipment that they're using to show the film that's not true that's not true thank god not in your face <laughs> jerks uh not if they have uh current or relatively current generation digital projectors the first generation of digital projectors yes they can't they can't show the higher frame rates but those who have made the transition more recently certainly can without any uh without any uh, further cost as far as i know well, we got an email from Mike M., uh, who was raving about his local theater. It's volunteer-run and maintained, offers a better experience in the multiplex. Uh, it's called Bryant Cinema, bryantcinema.com. And he said that the industry switch to digital distribution is affecting them. So that's probably what the slash dot posting means, which is theaters who haven't switched to digital yet are going to have to pay to switch to digital. Correct. Uh, Bryant Cinema yeah. is asking for donations to install digital equipment. Uh, so if if you're in uh, the area of Bryant Cinema and you want to help out, go to bryantcinema.com and check it out. Uh, thanks to Mike for uh, sending along that, that email. So, so it's not like if they have digital distribution already, Scott, that they can't show 48 frames per second. It's, it's that they ha whether they've made the digital transition or not. Correct. Okay. Correct. And there's certainly certainly there are plenty of film projector theaters still in in the United States and around the world that won't be able to show the higher frame rate, which is one reason why I, I I'm sort of an advocate of 48 frames per second, because that can very, very easily be down converted to 24 frames per second mm. for those houses where they don't have the capability. That's a good point. 48 divides nicely in half. Exactly, whereas 60 does not. No, it doesn't. Well, it divides to 30. And yes, right, but not. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's uh, check in on the summer movie draft. So this past week, That's My Boy with Adam Sandler and Rock of Ages came out both uh, pretty disappointing, 13 and 14 million, right in the middle of summer, too. Uh, so that leaves the, the standings unchanged. I'm in front with my Avengers inflated total, uh, Scott Johnson in second with his Hunger Games, and then Brian Brushwood, Veronica Belmont, Justin Robert Young, and Sarah Lane. Uh, and it really is all, at this point, we're all just kind of treading water until July 20th when the Dark Knight Rises come out, right, Brian? Yeah, that's the only real competition that you have to worry about. I mean, I'll tell you what, Tom, you have already shown a very impressive run. The fact that you still have movies to come out and you're at $602 million is phenomenal. I'm, this, this has been an exceptional year for the draft. Uh, meanwhile, I am, I am anxiously checking to see if my side bet with Justin is going to pay off whether Dark Shadows, The Dictator, Battleship, and Men in Black 3 are going to creep across that 357 million mark or not. Um, no update on that. I'll tell you as soon as I win me a stake. Now, coming out this weekend, we got three movies in the draft. Seeking a Friend for the End of the World uh, for Brian, who you paid two bucks for. Uh, so you almost can't It'll be lose. a surprise hit of the summer. So little for it. Uh, Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter, which is Veronica's uh, movie, which should do, I mean, it's, it's going to be a cult hit. It's not going to rack up big dollars, but it, it should be worth seeing, uh, and it should do all right. And Brave from Pixar is going to dominate the weekend. Scott, as we mentioned at the top of the show, you got to see it last night. I got to see it last it. night. I loved it. It was very, very good. I got to go to the red carpet. Actually, it was a green carpet. Uh, Hollywood premiere, a tr all out Hollywood premiere uh, in the in the best uh, tradition. Are they trying to be La environmental by having a green carpet? Uh, it, you know, I've I've gone down the green carpet on a number of things. The Grammys have had it for several years. I don't know whether it's uh, whether it's environmental. I do remember that at the Grammys a couple of years ago, it was because one of the big sponsors was Heineken. Ah, I thought maybe they were just CG ah. in the red carpet later. 
<laughs> they they could, want to have I the suppose. perfect red, so they yeah. made their green carpet. Down. Exactly. But it was at the, held at the new Dolby Theater, which used to be the Kodak Theater. Ah, uh, before uh, Kodak went bankrupt. <laughs> right, right. Before it became the Chapter 11 Theater, yeah. uh, where the Oscars are held. Uh, and it's not that, that theater is not intended to be a movie theater, but they kind of turned it into one. Uh, for this and for other things, because Dolby has signed a 20-year contract to Holy ha- cow. have it be the Dolby Theater, and uh, so they're going. And, and Dolby, in addition to the the Oscars, which are there in uh, in the first of the year, first part of the year, and uh, Cirque du Soleil has a show there called Iris, which is uh, all about the film industry, uh, and that's a live show that they that they hold there ten times a week. Uh, but Dolby is also going to be using it as a showcase, a place where they can show off all their latest technology, including this new audio format called Dolby Atmos, A-T-M-O-S, uh, in which there are speakers not only all around the audience, but overhead as well. So you get, you get surround sound that's not just around this way, but in the atmosphere. That's what the Atmos is for? Correct, correct. That's exactly right. And Brave is the first movie ever to be mixed with this Atmos sound. Now, it'll, of course, it'll be downmixed to 5.1 or seven, probably 7.1 uh, for most theaters. There are going to be 14, 15 theaters around the country that actually have an Atmos system built in, but that requires a bunch of speakers. In the Dolby Theater, uh, there are 164 speakers, Yeesh. including 44 overhead. So this is not something that's coming to my wow. home theater system anytime soon. No, no, no. It's strictly a commercial cinema thing. I expect it to be, you know, it'll it'll be available in the home sometime in the future with less than 164 yeah. speakers, probably. You know, maybe one or two or three. Well, uh, like they've got, they've got that one system. Uh, they got that one system that's just a bar with a whole bunch of tiny speakers that reflect stuff around your 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 room. So we're True. already seeing similar ideas with it. Well, true. The, what you're talking about is a sound bar with virtual 3D sound. Uh, they use right. head-related transfer functions and, and reflections off the walls to give you a, a three-dimensional soundscape. But it's nothing like having actual speakers surround you and, and over, over your head as well. Uh, the, the effect is quite good. The, the movie is very good. I don't want to give away any spoilers, of course. But, uh, you know, it's the classic hero's journey uh, with, a, fe- with a strong female lead. They've Sorry? done an amazing job uh, uh, when it comes to the promotion. I honestly don't know who the bad guy is or what the big challenge is. Like, were you able to preserve being spoiler-free going into the movie? Uh, was I able to preserve being like, spoiler-free? Did, did you like, see like, tra- it's amazing. the trailers and, and things? That oh, yeah, the yeah, I saw all the – sure, sure. <clears throat> but the, uh, there is no real villain. That's, that is an interesting point. I hadn't thought of that before. Um you know, it's really uh, a young girl uh, declaring her independence and her wish to be her own person and do what she wants rather than what society dictates. Uh, in this right. case, okay. uh, well, medieval, that, yeah. medieval Scottish uh, uh, clans, you know, coming together and she's betrothed. I mean, we've seen this in the in the trailer, so there's, I'm not giving anything away there. Um, right. You know, and she doesn't want any of it. She wants to be her own person and she likes to shoot arrows and princesses aren't supposed to do that and uh so it's a it's a whole story about her finding her way to her own self and uh and that really is is the tale and and like all pixar movies most pixar movies anyway um i think it does a great job the 3d is fabulous uh for those of you who like 3d um the dolby atmos if i'm going to post a story later today about it and i'm going to list all of the theaters that have Dolby Atmos and if there's one near you I do suggest you go see it or hear it because uh, uh, it really is very effective they, they did a great job of, of uh, birds flying overhead and um, arrows flying overhead all kinds of stuff like that it, it, it really worked very well stuff flying overhead right seems like the you know the, 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 the thing that you would want it for so that you feel like you're surrounded was there anything that surprised you in the way they used it uh no, I wouldn't say anything surprised me. It, it was used very effectively mm-hmm. to do what to do what uh, what they were showing on the screen. I wasn't seated in the best place, unfortunately. It was uh, you know this was a that that theater holds thirty four hundred people. Yeah, and wow. uh, you know I was uh, a member of, uh, of I was a guest of Dolby, and so they put me kind of under the 
the overhanging balcony in the first mezzanine. So there was some uh, bass buildup, and uh, the overall sound was a little bit harsh. Uh, I think if I'd been out down on the orchestra floor, it would have been a lot better. But uh, I do recommend that you go try and find an Atmos theater if you can. And uh, hometheater.com right is the place where you'll be posting the article about where the theaters Correct. are, right? Great. Correct. Mm-hmm. We'll try to put and, a link uh, in that uh, uh, And uh, per face for a radio in the chat room is asking, will Atmos Sound be used only in the 3D showings or 2D as well? I, I suspect it'll be only in the 3D showings in those 14 theaters around the country, which isn't very many. Yeah. Uh, undoubtedly, they will have 3D systems. Whether or not they'll have Dolby 3D is another question. We, uh, we, we saw it in Dolby 3D which is different than what most people see. Most people see Real-D or possibly IMAX. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dolby 3D is a different technology. It works very well. It's passive glasses, so they're not big clunky glasses. But I see, maybe it's because I wear glasses, but I see internal reflections around the screen. So it wasn't as engaging or immersive or drawing in of an experience as I've seen with the, the polarized glasses in the more common 3D theaters. All right. Well, good to know. I, I br- my opinion on Brave has changed since that first trailer came out. I was a little bored with it the first time I saw it. I'm like, eh, it's not really inspiring me. But the uh, further trailers that I've heard have got me more excited. And now hearing about this, I definitely want to try to find one of those Atmos theaters to yes. watch it in. If I, I think can. there might be one in San Francisco. I'll, really? I'll let you know. All right. Yeah, cool. I, I think, as I recall. Awesome. Well, let's talk about what else we're watching. What we're watching. I've actually uh, been playing so much Diablo 3 and reading so many books, I haven't been watching all that much stuff, but I am still watching, and, and Mad Men ended. Uh, I'm still waiting for Breaking Bad to launch. Kind of in a dead zone. I'm watching Eureka uh, on Sci-Fi, which is in its, la- you know, its last run, and they're doing a fantastic job with this season. Uh, and True Blood just launched uh, a week ago, and, and the first two episodes have now shown, and, and those were solid, solid shows. Uh, but Brian, what do you what do you got going on? You know what? I uh, well, first of all, we went out on a date on Saturday night. I saw Moonrise Kingdom, the new uh, uh, Wes Anderson. Oh play. yeah, I've been wanting to see and that. It was very very Wes Anderson. If you like Wes Anderson stuff, you're going to get a whole lot more of it. Um, the the only you ever notice in Wes Anderson movies, all the dialogue has this peculiar kind of stiltedness to it that you sort of get in this groove and you stop noticing it after a while. And it gives the entire movie this kind of dreamlike quality to it. You ever notice that? Uh, yeah, sure. I just feel like it's sort of like the Aaron Sorkin for Wes Anderson. It's it's his patter. It's his sure. his rhythm. Right. Well, in in the case of Moonrise Kingdom, it's the first time that I ever felt like it kind of took away from the immersion in it. Uh, and I and I suspect it's because it is so kid centric. There are so many kid actors that you have to follow. There was one. Uh, interaction between the two kids where it's just like I actually found myself checking my watch which I very rarely do at the uh, at the movies especially wow. since I don't own an actual rough watch um, <laughs> but the but, but, but it was uh, it, it wasn't it wasn't my favorite Wes Anderson film it was still very good uh, but uh, I, I dug it if you, if you like Wes Anderson you'll like it uh, but the thing I'm excited about is I finally checked out uh, Tron Uprising which was phenomenal uh, just like the Animatrix was everything I wanted um, uh, the Matrix sequels to be that they weren't. Tron Uprising is everything that I wanted that was missing from Tron Legacy. Tron Legacy, the, fir- the middle third of that movie, is nothing but people sitting around drinking space wine, glow in the dark. <laughs> and it's like uh, when, when they were having action, it was awesome. But then they, but, but, but the, the, the character side of thing I felt was acting, it was lacking. Uh, Tron Uprising, the art is absolutely gorgeous. It looks as good as the Animatrix. The style is phenomenal. The voice talent is amazing. You got Elijah Wood. You got Lance Henriksen as the big bad guy. Um, it it was amazing. And the, my favorite part of it was I started off by watching episode two because they're all for free for streaming right now on Disney.com. Uh, and and it was great because I I tuned in when characters had already been developed, when their situations were coming to a head, and I was seeing resolution. And I liked episode two so much, I went back to watch episode one, expecting it to be the ho-hum, we're establishing the characters, we're establishing the world kind of thing. But instead, when I started up episode one, it starts off with previously on Tron Uprising, which I thought was phenomenal. I've never seen a pilot that uh-huh. began yeah. with previous. 
and the, and they, and the reason was is because they had done a run of webisodes leading up to it that got all that tedious business out of the way. So essentially, it it was it was very similar to how my Battlestar experience went when I started with episode one, where they were just already uh, into the story and, and the Cylons were kicking their butts. And after episode one, I went back and watched the uh, the mini series to lead up to it. I, I think they've done an exceptional job on the launch of the show. The uh, the fight choreography is phenomenal. Uh, the CG is phenomenal. Uh, I'm very, very, very excited about uh, adding this one to my much wa- must watch list. And of course, Legend of Korra, continuing to watch. Scott, what about you? Have there been any, any other shows you've been watching, movies you've been watching at home, et cetera? <clears throat> well, I have to say, first of all, that I'm really happy to to know about this Tron um, follow up. Uh, what was it called again? Uprising. Tron, uh, uh, yeah, because, it's on uh, Disney XD, and and it's ostensibly targeted to kids. But but trust me, like uh, Bonnie walked in. When I was watching that for that the, that episode, and she was like, "This like she she was she couldn't believe that this was targeted to kids because it mm. looked like some of the grown up anime that we like." I'm so glad to hear that. I really want to check it out because I was so disappointed in Legacy. I mean, I had mm-hmm. great hopes for it, and uh, you know, I enjoyed the first movie as you know as camp fun, but uh, sure. the second one really fell flat for me. Uh, except for the 3D looked okay, but. Um, uh, you know, ha- knowing this is great. I myself, in terms of what I'm watching, uh, I'm looking forward very much to the last six episodes of The Closer on TNT. That's coming up July 6th, I think. Uh, I don't know if you guys watch right. and follow that show, but it's really good. Really good. Excellent crime drama. Um, other than that, I have to tell you, <laughs> I've been I've been mostly streaming uh, older shows that I haven't seen in a long time because I recently got this boxy box. and Nice. All of a sudden, uh, you know, I'm watching um, all the episodes of uh, all the different Star Trek series that I don't see very often that I, that I really like. And uh, uh, I recently found, uh, do you remember that show Sliders? Yeah, I love Sliders. Oh, sure, that was, sure. That, that was a great show. Uh, uh, John Reese davies and uh, um, Jerry O'Connell. Uh, that, that's, I've been watching that kind of lately. So uh, I've been kind of going back into my past lately, which has been pretty fun. Actually, yeah, when the Star Trek stuff came to Netflix, I, I went on a binge and, and watched a ton of the Oh, my the God, did series. you ever? Yeah. <laughs> hey, you're my kind of guy. I would have still now, been going, except the, the, I was in the animated versions, and, and some of the episodes started to mess up, started to be buggy. That kind of threw me off. Oh, really? Huh. Yeah. Some people in the chat room were talking about Falling Skies. Yeah, and it that... premiered last week. It's on my DVR. I, ha- I just haven't caught up and watched it. Uh, but it's... I, I was able to – I was invited to go see the uh, premiere – episode a couple of weeks ago at the Dolby offices here in in LA and uh, I have to say I have not been a fan of the Falling Skies uh, series up till now it's just more alien bad guys and and fighting against impossible odds uh, more of the same I, to me that's why I like it it's alien bad guys and fighting against impossible odds <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't if you throw some aliens in it it doesn't take a high bar for me I actually liked it a it's lot like better than bit- that dinosaur show that was on Fox oh the yeah uh, the uh, uh, Terra yeah, Terra Nova Terra Nova yeah, yeah. Nova. right well, let's finish up with some feedback now it's time for feedback with Brian and Tom on Frame Radio yeah I'm going to read the second one, Brian, so that you can read the first one. Uh, Dirk in okay. Moreno Valley says, here's a trick I haven't tried myself but should work. This is for HBO wannabes. Purchase a used Dish Network receiver from any of the usual sources like eBay or Craigslist. Sign up for mm-hmm. Dish Network service and ask for the Welcome Pack, which is $15 a month. Also sign up for HBO, which is $16 a month. You now have HBO Go legitimately for $31 per month plus any applicable local or state taxes. You don't even need to hook up the receiver if you don't want to. Just stick it in a closet or something. I talked to a Dish Network representative on the phone and confirmed that this would work. If you buy your own receiver, you do not need to have an installer come and hook it up, and you also do not need to hook it up to a phone line or even turn it on if you don't want to. This is probably the cheapest way to get just HBO Go. You can also go a little further and sign up for their Blockbuster service service and get all that streaming content and dvds by mail if you like so you need to buy the receiver so you can get the number off it to give them when you sign up but then i guess really they never check that's uh look this is this is what you get when you have willing buyers and people who refuse to sell you get kludgy 
weaselly things like this. And, and yes. it's, it's, it's human ingenuity. Yep, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. All right, I love you got, it. You got the so, last uh, email. Okay, yeah, the very first one here on line 48. Uh, hello, Brian and Tom. I've been listening to Frame Rate for a while now, and every week Brian mentions that he watches Cora, but you two never go any farther than that. I was wondering if you could give me a bit more discussion about the show. I also have started to notice a lot of similarities between Avatar and the part of the Dreaming Void series containing Idiard. If you haven't read them, they are amazing. Any thoughts? Uh, thanks for Frame Rate, Nathaniel. Uh, first of all, yes, I have read the Dreaming Void trilogy, and it is phenomenal. And in fact, um, uh, Tom, you, you've read The Name of the Wind, right? Yes, absolutely. Okay, so if you like the kind of scientific take on magic that they do in The Name of the Wind, then you should definitely read the Dreaming Void series because it gives a technological basis for a magic-type world where, uh, where, where people, like, they all... They're in this magic world, and they all know that they came from the stars, and they still have the ship there that they came from, but nobody knows how they got here or why. You know, they just assume magic is normal, and they don't understand why anything would be weird about it. It's phenomenal. Uh, and likewise, um, the world of the Legend of Korra and Avatar of the Last Airbender is one of the u most unique, uh, awesome uh, magic systems. Because you notice, like, when you get into a book, part of it is for the story, but part of it is for the set of rules in the world that you get to encounter. And uh, uh, what's amazing about the, the Legend of Korra is this is a wor world where different benders can affect different elements, uh, earth, air, fire, water. Uh, but you see them accomplish functional tasks with it. You know, you go to a city and the subway is run by these stone cars being moved by earth benders. Or you go to, um, uh, you know, you go to a, a, a ship that is powered by firebenders who, you know, uh, are, are burning things down in the belly of the ship or whatever. It is so cool and so grown up. Don't let the fact that it's on a, a kid network get you down. Go back and watch uh, Avatar The Last Airbender on Netflix instant streaming. Uh, the first couple episodes will look like it's a kid show, but very quickly you'll start to appreciate the high level of animation, the fact that they integrate different styles of martial arts. It is so rich and the backstory is so fun and the storytelling is so great the characters are so lovable you're gonna love it that's it hey, i just i just oh, go ahead, just found that i just found that on netflix actually i haven't started watching it yet but oh my I gosh little scott. Bit, i was a little bit intrigued the, what you're talking about sounds a bit like uh, orson scott card the uh uh alvin alvin maker, the alvin maker series. series yeah no i i think i think there's a lot that uh that between the two stylistically they uh the first series is set in kind of a feudal uh feudal japan kind of inspired world but uh -huh. then uh, what's great uh -huh. is is the second series cora takes place 70 years later and now uh technology has progressed and so you have things like movie theaters and telephones and uh but still within this magic based world uh oh, it sounds the, great. i think stylistically you know they're wearing zoot suits they look like they're from the 1940s it's, it's so much fun you guys you're gonna love it <laughs> Scott Wilkinson, thank you so much for uh, joining us. Of course, you can find his work at hometheater.com and uh, every week on Twitter at twit.tv slash HTG, Home Theater Geeks, which streams live on uh, Mondays. Your time is changing, though, uh, A as little bit, is yep. ours. That's right. I'm going to be moving from 1.30 to 1 o'clock. I'm uh, moving up by half an hour. And uh, frame right. rate starting on July 2nd will be at 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern on Mondays. So we'll be after Home Theater Geeks. Ah, back fantastic. Right on. Well, what a great lead in. Indeed. I'd love to come back on and uh, help uh, celebrate that that whole thing. Oh, absolutely. Anytime, Scott. That that would be a great that would be a great opportunity to do that. Let's do that. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, real quick before we wrap up, Tom, I'm assuming we don't have time or we're not going to do a spoiler zone because I don't think either of us saw anything that we really wanted to talk about, right? No spoiler zone, no. Okay. Well, then let me just uh, drop one plug. We didn't have a sponsor this episode outside of Scam School Book 2. It's only the greatest thing I've ever done, and I'm including my kids in that. It's available at uh, scamschoolbook.com, on iTunes, on Kindle, on Nook. It's way, way good. It's You're going to learn a bunch of tricks. You're going to become the life of the party at the bar. Uh, definitely head on over to scamschoolbook.com. Oh, look at this. There's a trailer right here. Maybe we'll throw the trailer on that. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so, where do you go to find the book again? Uh, scamschoolbook.com and uh, or, or just search Scam School on iTunes and Amazon Kindle and the Nook and you'll be able to jump in right now while we're recording this we're doing a targeted strike trying to get everybody to buy it at exactly noon uh, so if you're watching it right now just give me uh, book two just released book one is only 99 cents today only and you'll totally dig it
So check it out, scamschoolbook.com. And thanks, everybody, for watching or listening. You can find us at twit.tv slash fr. You can email us, framerate, at twit.tv. And we will be back next week with an all-new episode. See you then. Oh,